Do you have questions about how to manage short-term rentals? On this episode of Bootstrappers, we're gonna speak with Eva Wu at Better Stay in Washington State, and she's gonna give us a lowdown on how to do short-term rentals well. That's next. This is the Bootstrapper Show for Property Management, powered by Anaquim, a podcast where we have real conversations with industry experts that you can apply to your life and business. Welcome to Bootstrappers, where we talk about topics that are important to real estate and property management entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Gwen Aspen, here with my spouse, Jeremy Aspen. Mwah. <laughs> And we're really excited about today's show. We're going to answer the question, how do you manage Airbnbs and short-term rentals? Which a lot of people have questions on. We are going to talk to Eva Wu, who is a real estate entrepreneur in the Seattle area of Washington State and specializes in short-term rentals with her business, Better Stay. Bootstrappers is powered by Anaquim. Go to anaquim.net right now and download our free ebook about leadership development. A players only want to work at companies where they're being invested in and people are always driving and improving their business acumen. But as people who work in small or medium sized companies, it's really hard to know how to do that. So instead of doing a trust fall, just download the ebook at anaquim.net today. So with that, hi Eva, how are you doing today? Uh, Welcome. Hi, hi Jordan. how Jeremy? I'm good, thank you. Oh my God, we are so, ex- <laughs> sorry, are we so excited about this topic? Well, I've always wanted to know more about the short-term rental market because we've had, we've actually had them, but they're a very, you know, of our 1,200 units, we've maybe had two and never really drilled down to see how it works. Um, so, but there's so much of it going on these days. It's in the news. Lot, lots of municipalities don't like it because the taxing is a little bit different. Um, some property managers don't like it because the workload is just completely different. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, I would like to, I'm, I'm kind of curious to know how it works and if it's nice to work with other third party type of management. So I guess yeah. the, the first question is just tell us about your business. Sure. So um, I, I think that the business really was really born out of my own need as a property investor at the beginning. So um, I uh, uh, think a couple of years ago, I purchased a property up on Whitby Island. So that's about two hour drive north of Seattle. Uh, you know, it's like a nice destination where people go to for weekend getaways. So I purchased it with the intention of uh, running it as their Airbnb. So I set it up and everything. I was running it. I was managing it myself at the point. Um, I, I, I loved it from an investment perspective. It's, it's good cash flow, um, it's good return, but the day-to-day operation is a lot. Mm. Uh, but at that time, like you know, one property I can handle. But every time I talk to other um, you know, friends who are also doing this and other friends who are in uh, real estate who are also doing this, um, it's, it's just a lot on the operational side. And I think that's what has kept a lot of investors away from this type of uh, property investment. So we, just a couple of us who share the same pain, we just decided to you know, offer this service and, and really uh, you know, offer a full service management specifically for Airbnb with the purpose to build something that would make short-term rental more passive. Uh, and more viable for property investors. So, so, so what we do is all the way from, you know, we uh, get the listing ready uh, to launch the listing, have it go alive on Airbnb and other platform, and then handle all the guest communication, all the turnover. So basically it's like a more passive experience. For wow, how many, how many units do you all manage? So we, uh, we're we still small, we're still bootstrapping. Um, we started earlier this year, so we have about 10 units right now. Wow, but it is it is so much more time consuming. Jeremy and I go to Michigan for the summer and we were there and everyone's like, oh my God, do you ever rent this out? And we're like, no, 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 no. Yeah. We, we are not going to do that. It's terrifying. So um, yeah. what are the, cert- like on a big turn day, what does your day look like? So on a big turn day, that would mean like there are multiple check-in and check-outs. So our checkout window is, our checkout check-in window is 11 to uh, three or four. So let's say 11 to four. Uh, so guests will check out 11 and the next batch will come in. Um, we are, you know, because it's a summer, it's pretty much booked from back to back. So all of our turnovers are in the same day. So our cleaners are expected to, you know, get into the unit, um, clean, and then have it ready 
for the next guest before three or four. So um, on a really, really busy day, uh, about starting from 11s, where we get a lot of communication from cleaner uh, because they communicate to us on how, you know, the guests have left the unit, communicate if there's any problems. So managing that cleaner communication, uh, managing if there's any, uh, you know, surprises. Um, and then that's pretty much all the way to two, three o'clock. Uh, and then, you know, you, you will have guests inquiring about whether they can check in early, mm. uh, you know, whether units are ready. Um, and then after check-in, um, usually, you know, if they have questions on, you know, where to find stuff, how to yeah. operate stuff. Yeah. Because so that's that, what makes so it so different is that it's not yeah. just like, here's your apartment, here's your key. It's like, hey, where should I go? You know, where yeah. where's the blender, right? I mean, don't they have questions yeah. like that? They have a lot of questions, and I think the biggest, biggest difference between the uh, that and the managing, you know, long-term rental is uh, is that th that you're dealing with completely different customers, right? You're dealing with customers who are just staying in this house for like two, three days. They expect a perfect, you know, vacation. They expect everything to be, uh, you know, ready and working, and they have no knowledge of the house. Unlike you know, a tenants who live there for like six months to twelve months, and they really call this their home, and then you know, there's almost no, no troubleshooting, you know, appliances and that kind of question. But there's a lot of mm. that question. So, do you have it. any good stories about disasters that are turned back in? Because <laughs> in our industry, which is the annual, right, um, yeah. we 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 get a new story every month, like unbelievable, crazy stuff that the, the way that people leave properties. Do you guys have that or is it usually, I'm sure it's usually perfectly fine, but you must have a bad story. I mean, I mean, the worst we got so far are guests who, um, you know, they don't check out on time. Oh, um, that throws everything they, off. Yeah, they, they check out on time. They, they check out late and then they leave the unit in like a horrible state, ruined beddings, um, you know, have, you know, prints on the wall just require like extensive cleaning um, be because we put a lot of focus on screening guests. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that is the same for long-term management. You have to screen tenants, uh, but screening guests for uh, potential red flags for parties, oh. um, you know, looking at past ratings and sometimes stalk their Facebook profile. And then also about, you know, being upfront, communicating with them, asking about their purpose of travel. And, you know, um, so, so that, really has helped us i think we haven't had any horrible horrible story beyond just some unresponsible guests that's a here. that's a plus for going into that industry um so do you have to have if you're doing all these screenings in our industry fair housing is a huge deal and it can ruin your life uh, or your yeah. company uh, do you guys have to concern yourselves in with uh, fair housing in the short-term rental market that is that is good question because um you know, one difference that that also pertains to like when we talk about contracts and, and, and things for long term rental, there's a lot of laws and regulations um, regulating this industry. Um, so, for example, like if you terminate management contract with a property manager, the landlords still have to honor the lease, that kind of thing. But for short term rental, it's really like a hospitality industry more like. Um, because initially when we were setting it up, we inquired to our local like real estate boards to see, you know, necessary licensees. Um, in Washington, we don't even need to be uh, licensed as brokers mm. to do short term rental property management because the answers that we got are it's managed more like a hotel industry. Right. So so it's more like, oh, we have the rights to refuse service to anyone kind of a. Kind of oh wow i mean you don't go advertising white men only or anything like that no well maybe that's the that's a demographic they don't want yeah maybe that's, that's a demographic, demographic they're want. like oh you're a white man nope Ugh. nope we only um okay so one more thing it sounds like the fair housing thing is a win no real major disasters on the maintenance side how many evictions do you have every year <laughs> man i'm guessing none that's that's another win yeah, because uh, I think in Washington, if you stay less than 14 days, you don't have tenant rights. Right. No, oh, that's a good number. I didn't know that that was the number. So do you recommend, so if someone's going to get into this in a different state, they need to talk to the real estate board about the laws? Like any, no. I mean, or is that really not even necessary? 
Um, I, I would still check because I think every state is different. Mm-hmm. Uh, just about the the qualification of running a uh, of managing it, uh, managing a BM, especially if you're managing it with third party owners, you manage it on behalf of another client. Um, I think it's always good to check. So with those questions that people get about the specifics of the house, are you keeping those answers? How, how do you manage that material and who answers those questions? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, that, that we're in the process of like refining that right now. Um, so so it's very important to build. Uh, we call it like a knowledge base for mm-hmm. each property. I think that's really unique for short term rental because long term rental, you do not need to know how to operate like a remote off your TV because, right. uh, you know, you just don't get that kind of question um, and you don't you know, you don't care what kind of stove there is, whether it's gas versus um, you know, electric. So we need to know all that for these properties. Uh, so initially we started, of course, everyone starts with Google sheet, um, of like documenting, yeah. Yeah. um, all these, uh, little detail. But the problem is it's very hard to search for stuff when you get a question. Um, so we found this software called guru. What's it called? Guru.com. It's called guru. Guru. G U R U. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I think they they are uh, they basically is a software for you to build knowledge base. Oh. So you can have you can basically it's basically a, a software to organize all the info and it's really easy to search uh, and um, it's really easy to like look up info that are con- con- connected or um, you can organize info by property or by topics. So it's it's a lot easier to say hey property A. Um, what's the code for, you know, the community pool, for is example. That, it's really easy to find. I think I've seen that software. Is that one that you can also use to design the FAQ uh, for your website or mm-hmm. something? Okay, I, I've, I've seen that. I think so. Yeah. Maybe they have a plugin. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, so uh, in terms of who does it, um, right now our operations uh, team, I'm not team person, our head of operations. We're a very small team still. Uh, um, whoever that's managing all the guest communication would answer these questions. Uh, but we are in the process of uh, looking to onboard some of the uh, virtual assistants who can help us with some of the guest communication. But before that, we need to have our knowledge base ready and have all these tools uh, developed. For, for whatever it's for worth, them. if you want, afterwards, if you want to get together, I know a company that does um, <laughs> remote professionals virtual oh, assistants. Is that I'll, I'll, is yeah. that anaclim.net? Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we are working with them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, one other uh, question for you is, is there a software that's built for managing short-term rentals? Or are you trying to uh, use something yeah. that's not meant for it and just trying to make it work? Oh, uh, yes. We are using one that's built for uh, short-term rentals. It's called uh, Guesty. Guesty. G-U-S-T-Y. Um, so I... I I, I also have properties on the long term. So one of our partners actually, well, who connected us, Nick, he, he runs a long term management company. So so I'm I know he, he uses that folio. It's no way near what um, you know some of the bigger software in the long term property management field are capable of. Because overall, short term rental is still a very young industry. A lot of the softwares are still growing with it. So mm-hmm. we um, we looked at a few, uh, you know demoed a few and picked Guesty because they're right now the the big uh, the biggest in like the specifically the short-term rental field and they're also most well funded which means more resources for future development and all that so, so when it comes to software is Guesty um, does it interface with its own financial module and the maintenance module and uh, and actually the profile of the of the tenants are those all connected or do you have separate separate software those, those are connected okay uh, to an extent so for example at its core what every um what every short-term rental management software does uh is a channel manager so it connects your listing to various different platform you publish your listing to, uh, let's say Airbnb, Verbal, Booking.com, Expedia, and then it syncs all of the, it syncs its calendar across all these platforms. So then 
uh, it reflects your availability correctly on all the different booking sites. Ooh. So you're not you're not double you're not being double booked. So that's like number one at the core what each of these software would do at very basic level, and then it integrates all the communication to uh, within the software, so you can talk to guests just in your software. You don't have to open up like five websites at the mm. same time. So do you, and does then, it, can the guests like text you through the software questions or is it all uh, ca- making phone calls to you? So from a guest perspective, they actually don't know that we're using the software. Okay. Their experience would be to, to whatever platform that they are uh, using. Mm-hmm. So if they book via Airbnb, the message will come from Airbnb's messaging, Got like it. the app, Airbnb app. So when we reply messages, it's through the app. Verbal, it's through email because that's how you communicate on verbal. Uh, but uh, all, all the listing will have a phone number as well. So uh, get, sometimes guests will call us when there's emergency. So I kind of, if it's okay, I, I want to know more about the maintenance thing because you work, yep. you have a maintenance department or, or at least you work with maintenance um, on the long term. And in those cases, it's just, it hits every, at the end of every month. It's pretty regular, right? You can predict at the end of a month or the beginning of a month, you're going to have a peak of, of activity. So how does it work when you have to have people probably more dedicated to your properties and they have to get the whole thing done right now. I mean, that's always been what scares me about the industry because it's hard enough to get people to go in and clean properties, much less mm-hmm. in a four hour window, very consistently. On the weekend, uh, you know, generally speaking. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that is, that is a good question. Um, for it, it is tough. Uh, because so it, it depends on what kind of uh, uh, repair or maintenance tasks there are. Um, usually, we get a notification from guests saying that so and so, like certain things aren't working. Um, we it's so what we learn is that it's not necessary. Like we don't necessarily need to wait until. Uh, when there's no one in the house, like in between guest mm-hmm. checkout, to squeeze in repair. Uh, you know, for example, if the AC is broken and, and it's a really hot day, um, guests actually would appreciate if we get, you know, the maintenance crew or um, a technician to go over right away. Um, and then um, all of our all of our units are are um, equipped with a digital lock. So then, as long as the guests are okay with it, um, we can go in and handle these tasks. It doesn't have to be in between the turnover. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So for some of the more maintenance stuff, um, we do try to schedule it in between, you know, that four hour window. So, and um, it's not, you know, not every property is booked 100 percent of the time. That would be a, a, a really good problem to have <laughs> is that you have no time for maintenance. Um, but, you know, there are slow seasons where we can squeeze in some of the more regular uh, maintenance tasks. So are you having to buy like sheets and towels really regularly? Do you just have like inventory for those things or how does that work? So that's a good question. So there are, for us, there are two kinds of um, what we call supply. Uh, One is consumables. Uh, So these are things that guests use like coffee, cream, sugar, all the condiments, like toilet paper, garbage bag, those kind of things. So that, so we would cover all of that. Um, we would uh, we would buy the initial stock. Um, it comes out of our fees, uh, and it would, uh, and then we would do regular stock up. And we rely on the cleaners to let us know, like if these are looking low, and then we would just purchase um, and then have the cleaner stock up. And then the other kind is the sort of the more durable supplies, like sheets, plates, mugs, you know, utensils, that kind of stuff. We, um, so the owner actually uh, buy them. At the beginning of when we set up a listing, we would go visit the property and then provide the owner um, like a, a checklist on how many of these things to buy. Um, and then we recommend, so for example, for sheets, um, we, we'll, we'll have all of them buy all white sheets and you know three sets per bed uh, for you know turnover and replacement. Um, and then, so the, the reason for the white sheets is that, you know, if something is dirty, um, it can be bleached. So it can, it's still oh. savageable, uh, unlike some of the more patterned ones. So, so when, uh, when a sheet is beyond, I guess, 
beyond salvage. repair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, then we do replace those. We replace those and then just charge it to the owner. So we do provide that replenishment service though. And just kind of following up on the the maintenance piece. Mm-hmm. And, and I have a story for this if we want to hear it, but uh, do you have the same people that manage or the maintenance or do the cleaning uh, in a long-term rental, do the cleaning in the short-term rentals? Cleaning. We, um, so I think, so for one, I, I, I don't have a long-term rental management business, uh, but I, I think when we, you know, hire cleaners for a short-term rental, uh, we want them to have short-term rental experience. Um, and, um, I, our cleaners for short-term rental, they only do short-term rental. Yeah. And I, that I would yeah. imagine, cause we tried doing it the other way and the lack of, or the, it didn't seem like the long-term maintenance crew or the cleaning crews really got a, a thorough understanding of how important yeah. it was to be on time and within scope time-wise yes yes and it's very very uh and it's very different so i think for the the long-term management crew it's, they usually deal with like move in move out cleans right so it's um usually the either the unit's empty um there's less there's more of like the the cleaning itself less of more of a less of a Make you know them. you're really creating an experience you have right. to you know set up you have to put things arrange them in a nice way uh it's just a different skill set I right. think. right i think that's absolutely right so anybody that's looking to get into that industry um i i think in my experience and from what i hear you saying you can't necessarily scale uh into the short-term rentals with your long-term uh, maintenance crews so when you're onboarding these new owners, I mean, that must be an extensive process. Do you ever have to tell them that their decorating's ugly? <laughs> <laughs> that, is, uh, that is such a good question. Um, so, so no, we don't, but there are several ways to, you know, kind of um, communicate <laughs> that. Um, so, when, so, so for, for, for a short-term rental owner, you know, management's one, like management's one reason why a lot of them don't start because it's, you know, uh, a lot of work. The second biggest hurdle is the furnishing, um, because you would have to, you know, decorate a house and get it all furnished and buy furnitures and ship them and set them up, uh, which is a lot of work. So a lot of the uh, property investors, they like buying turnkey properties where it's already come furnished. Maybe the previous seller, the sellers also, you know, use this as a rental. Uh, And then the furniture that comes with it are often like aged. Um, So, so we do, we do this. So we would, before we take on properties, we would go and visit. Mm -hmm. Um, and we will pair what we call an owner onboarding checklist, which is we go through room by room and then lay out our advice for improving this space. So we don't just point out problems. We uh, we tell them, you know, what are the better solutions. And uh, so then they don't, um, you know, some of them know, but you know, they don't have anything better or they don't really know what to do. So presenting them with advice rather than, um, you know, opinion would be is that's one thing that we do is oh you can buy instead of this bed you can buy maybe this um or you know you can think about putting another silver chair here Uh, so that's that's one thing and then second thing is we actually invest with the owner so um before the listing goes live we would buy so photography is on us so we do two things we uh we cover photography Hmm. And then we um, outfit the unit with a digital lock um, for 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 these reasons. For the digital lock, we what we really wanted to do is standardize entry. Right. We don't want each unit to have a, its own different ways of check-in. So that's a nightmare in, in management. And then for the photo is we would want to pay for good photography. Uh, we don't want to put that on right. the owner's. Although, you know, because photos are so important. That's like yeah. the only marketing there is. Right. Um, so we take that on us to really control the quality of the photos. So that could mitigate some of the, the decor as well. So, so overall, I'm jealous about the key boxes because in our industry, because there's uh, intermittent Wi-Fi, and by intermittent, I mean when people move out, there's a house <laughs> with no Wi-Fi. And usually I think those lock boxes depend on Wi-Fi or a little bit more of a complicated cell phone sort of system. It, I, from what I've seen, it hasn't really worked out, um, but I'm mm-hmm. guessing it works for you because you just have Wi-Fi on, free Wi-Fi. Yes, yes. 
Boy, that's yes. nice. And for and for areas that sometimes we have houses that in area that's too remote that they don't have Wi-Fi, then we mm-hmm. still do a digital lock, um, but it will just be a fixed code. Um, it's like a battery operated one. So but any, we we yeah. Uh, I was just gonna say so anybody that's in uh, my industry, which is the third party long term property management. This industry seems kind of interesting in that no major maintenance disasters. Wow. Fair housing is not really a thing. And no evictions. I I wouldn't say no um, major disaster because I've heard horrible stories, which we're trying to, I mean, you hear about guests burning. And, and you know it, that could totally happen if you have like a party in there no but and then the revenue is pretty good right i mean it's better than uh, are you, i know you have to share so they you have to pay the airbnb and those websites quite a bit of money and then your fee are the owners making a lot of money on these when, once everything's kind of said and done yeah they're still making um more cash flow uh net net than like a long-term rental uh but they're so airbnb they actually don't take much out of the owners they take three percent um and then but they but airbnb charges guests quite a bit um, because there's like a hefty booking fee when uh guests book airbnb and that, that which is paid to the airbnb and not to the the hosts um and then there's our fees which are higher than short term uh, than long term of course because there's uh, more work involved um a so lot overall, more work i can't e- i mean a <laughs> lot more a lot work. more yeah and then on an annual basis you know we're still seeing higher cash flow uh but it's very seasonal so that's another thing is you have to look at on an annual basis or um of course across the year average monthly basis because every month could be different depending on where your properties are i would say like downtown seattle in um you know if you have like a two-bedroom townhome uh in downtown seattle in the summer you could be making like upwards of eight nine thousand uh in the winter you might be looking at like three four thousand so it's just um it varies a lot um and if you're in a you know like a beach house that's even more seasonal are you having to pay your cleaners like a huge premium because it's so intense and it's time sensitive and they have to be more sophisticated than maybe an average cleaner? Mm. So uh, good question on cleaner payment. Um, so uh, for Airbnb and Verbal, when guests book, uh, there is a cleaning fee that the guests pay. Oh. We usually set that to equate to what a cleaner would charge. So then that essentially is a pass through. Mm. So let's say a cleaner charges like $150 to turn over a house. Uh, we would set that. We would set the cleaning fee as $150. So our goal is just not to, like to break, break even on the cleaning fee part. So neither the owner pays nor it comes out of our fee. So it's just a pass through from uh, the guest to the owner, uh, to, to the cleaner. And um and we, we really treat the cleaner as a truly part of our team because they are so important to us. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah. So we have mechanism to like really motivate them and like hear their thoughts. They usually have really good suggestions as well because they are in the unit way more often than, um, than us. So they're kind of like our on the ground team. Mm-hmm. Do you bonus so. them based on like reviews or anything like that? We do. We do. So we bonus them. And then we also, um, you know, try to reward them for like, you know, going extra miles, um, you know, doing things that aren't part of their scope, but it's just, you know, nice. And then, um, and uh, we, we would have, you know, conversations with them periodically to learn about how they're doing, if they have any feedback, like one-on-ones, like really treat them as part of our team. Oh, um, that's great. And, and you, that yeah. must be essential to be successful in this arena, because really the cleaner is the most important person in this whole dynamic, right? Yeah. Like for example, this morning, we were just having a conversation with our Seattle, one of our Seattle cleaners, um, and she's she's awesome. She's a, a stellar um, a cleaner. We were actually having a conversation to encourage her to grow uh, because we are growing. And, um, you know, at one hand, we don't I know there's a limit if she is cleaning each unit herself. So we're trying to, you know, um, introduce her to this like whole entrepreneur mindset that maybe she can go and hire more people and train them so she can expand her business and then we can grow, you know, we, they can grow with us. Um, so, so, so we do care about our, our, our cleaners and making sure that they are also doing this, um, sustainably because right. it's quite, 
hectic on a busy day. Oh, I can't even imagine. So what is the hardest part of your job? Uh, I think crisis management. You don't, you never know what, um, you never know what will happen during a guest stay. And you will never know when a cleaner steps into a house, what what they will find, well, like what the guests have let the, left the place in. So I guess uh, crisis mitigation, just be prepared, like having creative solutions, uh, like damage control. Because like, what's an I think, example that you've run into? Uh, so, so one of our property on Whitby, it sits on a high bluff. Uh, so it, that area has a lot of sand. Um, so there's a hot tub in that, and it's like the worst location to have a hot tub because you have high wind, you have lots of sand, um, and there's once I think the guest had accidentally, uh, I think broke the spinet like in the bottom. So basically they, you know, accidentally are, were draining the water pretty slowly to the point where the, the hot tub was only like a third full mm. and uh, it was full of sand because the cover was left open. Uh, so that hot tub basically, it, it took the hot, hot tub down for like three days because it needs cleaning, it needs refilling water and it takes like a day for it to heat back up because um, it's like 600 gallons of water. Mm. Um, so then that inevitably put the hot tub out of use for the next guest because the next the guests usually stay for three days. So, you know, when things like that happen, uh, you know, you're definitely ruined another person's vacation. So that's the saddest part. That's the hardest mm-hmm. part is there's no, there's no makeup for it because the, the, they're only there for three days. If something doesn't work, something doesn't work, you need time to fix it. So I think that's, that's the hardest part. And also the saddest part is sometime, you know, you don't, live up to the guest expectation and they didn't have a, a great time yeah and yeah. Then, right yeah and i mean that's you stressful do, for you too because yeah, i can tell yeah. that you're like a, you want to please the owner and the guests like you come across as someone who's like really committed to this so i can only imagine yeah. the stress that's actually really important to us because the best part of this job is you know, when a guest really, really enjoyed our place, they loved it, they had like, you know, they were there for their anniversary. So a lot of these destination houses um, that we have like near Rainier or like up on the islands, um, a lot of people book them for anniversaries, birthdays, celebrations. It's, you know, it's special moments for them. So it, it makes us happy when, you know, they had a great time and they really enjoyed the property. So that, that that's the best part. And then the flip side is the worst, which is, you know, something happened and and you can't, you know, you, you disappoint them. Mm-hmm. So what is your business model long-term? Are you hoping to get really big? Like, do you feel like this is a scalable business for you? Uh, we definitely want it to grow. We want it to grow, um, I think because of our initial footprint, because when, when, the, when the group first came together, uh, you know, uh, we, have the four, we have four partners. Um, when we put our own properties together at the very beginning, our properties are already pr- pretty spread out. Like we, our, we have properties all the way up to Whitby or all the way down to like Rainier National Park. So that's already like a four hour drive distance. So south, you have two hours south of Seattle, or you have two hours north of Seattle. So that, that is already a pretty big radius. So from the get go, um, we are big in geographic coverage and not only restricted to like Seattle city. So uh, we, we definitely can grow uh, the biggest. Um, so our, I guess our business model is when we're in a region, uh, we work with local resources, like local cleaners, local handyman, like build up a local team. Mm-hmm. Then we can scale in that area um, to take on properties in that area. Um, I, I, I do, we, we are looking to grow. Um, but at the same time, we're eager to uh, just set up a lot of the processes processes right from the beginning mm-hmm. so that you know we're not dragged down by operations. So things like building good knowledge bases, uh, you know, train our assistants to you know operate efficiently. So that can that can free us up to do more of the onboarding stuff. Wow. Well, this has been so enlightening. Thank you, Eva, for explaining short-term rentals to us. And if you're looking up Eva, make sure you look up Better Stay in Puget Sound, right? Like that's where you are on Google, not Seattle. Uh, yes, yes. And then um, 
I think I can also leave my website. If oh, you let's have do that. Yeah, yeah. Let, join the link. No. Yes, yeah. yes, we will have the link in the show notes. So check out Eva Wu. Eva, thank you so much for being on the Bootstrapper Show. It's been a true pleasure. Nice meeting you. Yeah, thank you for having me. Nice to meet you guys. Bootstrappers is powered by Anaquim. Go to anaquim.net right now and download your free ebook on leadership development. Leadership development is a super hard thing for small, medium, and even large companies. Get the step by step guide at anaquim.net. That's a wrap. We'll see you next time on Bootstrappers. This is the Bootstrapper Show for Property Management, powered by Anaquim, a podcast where we have real conversations with industry experts that you can apply to your life and business.